Girl, doing the work is hard. Like you hear so much in the spiritual community. Are you doing the work, doing the work? Like it's not easy. You have to really look at yourself, look at your relationships, look where you're spending your time, your money, and your energy. And that's not fun because chances are there's a huge monster hiding in your closet that you haven't looked at for a decade because you've been so busy slamming gin and tonics at happy hour. You know, (laughs) it's easier to live in this wool covered over the eyes world. But once you wake up, it's so much better. It's just better. I'm Casey Main, a jaded, hopelessly romantic, health conscious party girl searching for meaning. And my mission is simple, to make life better for myself and for you. I believe real change always comes from within. And the Better You podcast was born to discover hidden parts of ourselves and our stories. A safe place where we have real, honest conversations with people from all walks of life to help better understand ourselves so we can become better versions of ourselves. So come along on this journey of discovery with me so you can become a better you. And welcome back to another episode of the Better You Podcast. I am your host, Casey Main. As always, thank you very much for being here. You have a lot of options with what you do with your time and what you choose to listen to, whether it be podcasts or music or the news or whatever. And I just, I appreciate you choosing me and this show. So this week's episode is a spiritual one. So if you've been listening to the show for a while, you know, I tend to have shows that fall in either like mind, body, or spirit. And we've done um, a lot of mind stuff, kind of the psychology and mindset things. But if you've been listening for a while, you know that I love the spiritual conversation. So I'm very excited to share this conversation with you all. It is, we do get pretty deep, pretty woo woo, um, but I love it. I think it is a great conversation and I think everyone will get a lot out of it. And while we don't get specifically into current events, um, whether that be the pandemic or the Black Lives Matter movement, it is relevant, especially uh, for the Black Lives Matter movement. Because our guest today, Morgan, is very honest in the beginning of the conversation about kind of prior to her spiritual awakening, she was living this kind of charmed little life. And she talks about living a very privileged life. And then something happened and it completely changed her perspective. And that's really relevant right now because I think it can be all too easy to start to think that our experiences and our perspective and our norm is the norm for other people or, or for everybody. And it's like, while on a logical level, you know, that isn't the case. Sometimes it takes really intense experiences to really wake you up out of that and make you realize like, Whoa, like people are living very different lives than we are. So your perspective can shift and, and you can open your mind and start to see the world from a different lens, which is what happened to Morgan and, I talk about that a little bit from in my life as well, but we recorded this episode. It was before I started reading White Fragility, which, as I mentioned in last week's episode, is just totally blowing my mind. And so it was before I really started to expand my perspective and open my mind to, first of all, just the definition of racism. I had been living in my very charmed and privileged life with a very narrow definition of what racism is, which I think is true for a lot of us. And so now as I've started to educate myself more, I have a much broader definition of it, which then widens your perspective and helps you see where you've played a part in it. Not necessarily in like explicit acts or outright hatred or anything like that, but just more kind of this 
silent compliance within a much larger system that you didn't even realize you were a part of because you had never really looked at it because you were kind of blind to it because you were living your life and thinking your norm was the norm. At least like that's, that's the case for me. So there are parts of this conversation that when listening back through it, like I wish I would have taken it in a different direction. And like, I wish I would have had the self-awareness to admit like she does, you know, where and kind of how I've been, to be completely honest, like a bratty asshole. Um, but I didn't have that awareness yet. And that is on me. I take full responsibility of that, but I am taking the steps to educate myself. And I hope you guys are as well, if you feel compelled to, and if you don't, then that's where you are. And, and that's that. So a little bit more about today's guest. Morgan Garza is an author, teacher, entrepreneur, and community leader. She is an embodiment of the divine feminine here to empower others to become their own guru by stepping out of the darkness of fear and into the light of activated awareness. Her first book, Soul Magic, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Mystics, is now available for pre-order, shipping in August 2020. And in this episode, we discuss what her life looked like prior to her spiritual journey and the incident that caused her spiritual awakening the realizations she came to about herself and the way she had been living, how it can seem easier to stay spiritually asleep than to do the spiritual work, the importance of the contraction within the spiritual journey. It's not all about expansion. How she started paying attention to the no's and yeses so she could find the life that was right for her, how to distinguish between fear and intuition, which is something I constantly struggle with, the power of doing nothing, what shadow work is and how to do it, how there is no fast track to healing, and her upcoming book that looks at the ancient traditions and history behind our modern spiritual practices. If you enjoy this conversation or you enjoy spiritual conversations in general and you're relatively new to the podcast, then I want to point out a couple previous ones that I think you will enjoy. So you can go all the way back to episode 19, Modern Spirituality and Connecting with Our Intuition with Nikki Novo, episode 38, Understanding and Addressing Our Holistic Self with Dr. Erica Matluck, episode 39, Yogic Principles for Life and a Pandemic with Ashton August. Episode 44, Death, God, Religion, and Mysticism with Reverend Peter Panagore. Episode 48, Embracing the Real Rebel Within You with Katie Buman. And episode 40, Listening to Life and the Keys in Your Genes with Paul Kuhn. And then make sure you are subscribed because next week, I believe, is going to be another spiritual episode. I'm pretty sure on my calendar I've moved a couple things things around, but I believe next week will be a spiritual one as well, or maybe it won't. So make sure you are subscribed so you don't miss it. All right. That is it for the intro. We are going to go ahead and jump into this very spiritual conversation with the wonderful Morgan Garza. I'd love to start with your story and kind of how, how you like, what is the work that you do and how did you get into this work? I got into this work and by this work, I mean, I'm an author, I'm a community leader. I do a lot of different things, but I think the catalyst of what amplified my interest in not only spirituality, but in sharing spirituality and exploring it in a a public space was surviving a terrorist attack in India in 2008. And that really made me realize that not only seeing the, like the destruction of that kind of terrible situation happening right before my eyes, but also realizing that I had been so far removed from everything like that growing up. Um, So when I experienced that it was an awakening in a way that helped me understand not only my place in the world, but how I could also help to change it by changing myself and acting differently and changing my behavior and really becoming more aware and authentic in how I led my life. I mean, I was in my early twenties, I was 22. So, you know, at that point in your life, you think, you know, everything, but you don't really know shit. So an experience like this is extremely 
eye opening. And so I just really, I would like to say I dove in, but between the PTSD and just kind of like accepting what had actually happened, it was a while. It was a, it was a decade long unfurling of my previous way of living and moving into a more intentional, activated, aware and authentic space. Okay. So I, I want to get into kind of what was your previous way of living, but first, like, why were you in India? <laughs> I was working in fashion at the time I went to school for fashion in LA and I was working in wholesale and we were there to sample the spring line. It was a routine okay. travel, work travel experience. Yeah. Okay. And then what happened? Like what was the terrorist attack? It was a citywide attack that happened simultaneously. So it was incredibly well organized and they attacked the hotel that I was staying in and the hotel that I was having dinner in. So there were two different places, a train station, a very popular market, a really popular cafe, and a lot of other um, very frequented locations. And it was a siege on the entire city. I mean, things were burning. The police didn't even show up at the time because it was so terrible. I mean, you didn't even hear sirens. It was just, it was wild. But that realization that life is so precious and that so many things can be taken immediately and the survivor's guilt really catapulted me into understanding life more and why I was spared when so many weren't was a hard thing to come to terms with. Yes. Yes. Okay. And, and there's a lot to unpack there, but what prior to that incident, um, how would you describe your, yourself and your life and your spirituality, if you even had any, or did you grow up in any kind of organized religion? Like what was your life before that point? Oh, girl, I'm a recovering Catholic. That is going to also be a lifelong unpacking of the moral <laughs> guilt that I have oh. been raised with. <laughs> oh, I know. I went to Catholic school, uh, kindergarten through high school. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm right there well, with you. <laughs> you know, so that, and I was just, I was clueless. You know, I had always had a very charmed life, was raised by loving parents who always had wonderful jobs and gave us anything we needed, anything we wanted. It was just easy. I was great at school. I always got straight A's without trying. I mean, it was just, a, it was truly a charmed life devoid of a lot of real world awareness. Mm -hmm. And I think I was just, I was like a bratty little kid until my twenties. I always thought that I should get everything my way and why shouldn't I, you know? So I was I was raised with this inherent privilege of who I was and how easy things were. And I just thought life was like that. And after, when I came home, I mean, I was just so taken with how much my parents had sacrificed for us. I really just had more perspective on mm -hmm. everything. And I started being kinder. I started really being very intentional with my words and how I treated people and what I did with work, I changed careers. I mean, it was just an entire shift in my reality and my experience because of experiencing something that was so different from what my daily life was and nearly losing my own life. I was like, fuck this way of being. I have to be better. I have to be better. So, so that's interesting because I'm sure that wasn't your first international trip. But it was so it wasn't so much the exposure to a, a a way of life and and a geography that was very, very different, but more so the like near death experience. Yeah, it was. I mean, I grew up on the border of Mexico and Texas. We would go to Mexico after church for lunch. I was very much a proud Hispanic. And so I saw a lot of the kind of living situations in Mexico that were very different from mine. So it wasn't so much the cultural aspect of it. It was, it was really just the fragility of life. Mm -hmm. Was there like a, a first kind of aha moment that you had about life? Like what was kind of the first big realization that kind of woke you up, so to speak? It was like, I've been an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> 
I've just been an absolute, I mean, I'm a very nice person, but I, there were just a lot of assumptions that I went through life with that were completely dismantled after that experience. And it was, it was one of those things that when it happens, you'll never be the same and there's no unseeing it. There's no unexperiencing it. There's no going back. So it was only coming to terms with what it was and the pain of realizing the kind of person that I'd been and not that like I'm making myself out to be a terrible person. I was just clueless. I mean, I truly Mm -hmm. was just clueless. Yeah, no, I, I know what you mean. I think it's, it's, it's all perspective and it's all individual. So, cause I, I didn't, I by no means had a similar experience, but I had a little bit of a wake up moment where I wasn't my, my first realization wasn't, Oh my God, I've been an asshole. It was more, Oh my God, I've paid zero attention to this larger idea of like, there's a purpose why I'm here. Like there's a bigger, there's a bigger picture to life. And I've just been totally consumed by all this stupid shit of like my social life and going out and partying and whatever. And so it was, it, it was kind of that, that, that wake up moment for me. And so, you know, if you compare it to other situations, it's easy to be like, Oh, like I wasn't that bad, but it's, it's, those internal shifts that can seem Mm -hmm. like they're not a big deal, like feel monumental at the time. Yeah. And I only have this perspective from hindsight. It wasn't like I was in the moment, like, wow, I'm an asshole. I need to change. But there were just things that happened that naturally put me into a different direction. And this is the awakening. So many spiritual experiences come from catastrophe Mm -hmm. and an incredible loss or pain or something that really shakes you to your core. And then nothing's ever the same for the better, for the best. So then what did that, what did the rest of that, like, so you had that moment and then like, what did the rest of that process look like for you? Because I think it's very complicated and difficult, at least it was for me to kind of let go of who I was prior to that kind of aha moment. Mm -hmm. Like that was, it was not easy because there's a part of you or there's a a huge chunk of you that's like very rooted in who you were because you've always been that person. And then when you try and change that, it's difficult for you and it's difficult for the people in your life. So like, what did that process look like for you? I mean, it was an ego death. It was, it was coming to terms with the person that I was and not really wanting to, or relating to that person anymore. And I, I, I didn't lose a lot of friends, but I had a lot of hard conversations and, and my party friends went away and there was only my core left. And the way that my life looked previously was very vapid and vain. And I just completely shifted. I mean, I went to fashion school, I was working in fashion and all of a sudden I'm representing this industry that is pretty terrible when you get into it, not saying that everybody is, but the way in which fashion operates is incredibly dehumanizing for the people that produce the goods that we proudly pay a very pretty penny for. So Mm -hmm. it was, it was just an unraveling and an understanding of where I was and just sitting with that for a while and being okay with not wanting what I had before and not being who I was before and then being empowered by that and moving forward into what felt right. I had no idea where I was going. It was completely uncertain. I I just didn't know, but I knew what felt good. And so I followed the feeling and I knew it didn't feel good. So I didn't do things with people that previously was my entire weekend before. Like I was very much a party girl as well. And I love that you say that in your intro for your podcast, but (laughs) it's kind of like, you have to go through, you don't have to, but there it's these wild times that give you the grit to understand what really matters. Mm -hmm. Is there any, do you ever have those moments today where you miss that prior version of yourself or you feel tempted to go back to that, even though, you know, you couldn't, but it's kind of like that, uh, life was almost easier then. <sighs> That's funny that you say that. Sometimes it was really easy being asleep. It's so yes. <laughs> easy to be spiritually asleep and you just go through the motions. And I see people when it's like a crazy full moon or like a really intense eclipse season. And I'm like, my life is falling apart. Like in those moments, I don't miss being asleep, but I do think back on how easy life was. But then really, was life really easy? 
I was dating not a great person. I was in a career that didn't fulfill me or help me shine the most or give back in any way. So it's like, sure, emotionally, it may have been easier, but that's also not sustainable. You can't sustain that for a long period of time. It's going to eventually come out. That shadow will hunt you down. Yes. Oh, I, I feel that on a, on a deep level. And I, and I struggle sometimes with kind of that when, when I'm struggling in kind of my current life of being like, oh, it was just easier when I, like you said, when I was like spiritually asleep, when I didn't care, when I, I didn't have like the awareness I had now. And so, um, I'm glad to know I'm not kind of (laughs) You're not alone alone. in those moments. Girl, doing the work is hard. Like you hear so much in the spiritual community. Are you doing the work, doing the work? Like it's not easy. You have to really look at yourself, look at your relationships, look where you're spending your time, your money, and your energy. And that's not fun because chances are there's a huge monster hiding in your closet that you haven't looked at for a decade because you've been so busy slamming gin and tonics at happy hour. You know, (laughs) (laughs) it's easier to live in this wool covered over the eyes world. But once you wake up, it's so much better. It's just better. It it, it is. I I might be in a little bit of a lull right now to fully agree (laughs) with that, but, (laughs) but but everything is cyclic. cyclic. You're going to be on top of the mountain and then you're going to be at the bottom of another valley. It, that's true. And I feel like that is an important part of the work too, is accepting all those different seasons. And it's really hard when you're in a difficult season because you're like, oh, I just want to you know, move past this. And especially if you're in this work of personal development, spiritual development, you like feel all this pressure to, to never feel that way, to almost like be above it and like rise above it. And so to take those moments to be like, nope, this is where you are. And so just sit in it. Well, there's a huge misconception that once you have your spiritual awakening, it's going to be all butterflies and rainbows and like seeing one, one, one everywhere and understanding your natal chart perfectly and never having a bad day and living in this love and light bullshit. But (laughs) truly a spiritual awakening is, I'm not from, no, if you're familiar with tarot, but the tower card, it's Godzilla rape, like ram rampaging through a city, tearing everything down so that you can rebuild it. And that is shitty. (laughs) Yeah, it is. And it's, it's complicated and it's a long process. Like it's It's not not like, like, yeah, you don't read a horoscope one day and then you're like, Oh wait, Oh my God, I understand the whole universe now and everything's wonderful. And you go skipping out onto the street and then you just like manifest in real time. Not saying that manifestation in real time isn't possible, but a spiritual awakening isn't something truly to like, I don't know, throw a party for like, you're going to be sitting in your bed crying, going through your whole life that you previously thought was one way. And now it's another, it's like extreme disclosure. Yes, but it's great. (laughs) And then you're on the (laughs) other side and then you're going to have expansions and you're going to have contractions, but You can't always be expanding because then you're going to dissolve and you can't always contract because then you're just going to turn into a super dense black hole. So it's in the breath of the movement of, of realizing something and then contracting to integrate it and then opening back up and expanding even more. It's like one step forward, two steps back. That contraction is so Mm -hmm. important. And so many people think that just because they're contracting that they're not having the spiritual experience that they thought they would, or they're not doing the work, or they're not actually expanding as much as they thought they would through their spiritual awakening. So there's this whole like kind of shaming around going into your own personal black hole and having that super important contraction and not always be blooming. Yeah. that And that's been something I've really been working on is that acceptance of whatever moment I'm in, whether I'm expanding or I'm contracting and just to be aware of that and like, be okay with that. And, and it's difficult because I think there is a lot of pressure out there to never be in those darker moments. Mm -hmm. And then I think it can also be difficult if you don't have like a circle of people around you that are going through something similar and you kind of feel like 
you're You're crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're crazy and you're alone and you're seeing things and you're hearing things. And because you're opening, you're having these spiritual experiences that are unexplainable and profound. And while they are deeply personal and you can lose a bit of magic by telling someone like, I saw this crazy thing happen the other day. And they're like, no, you did it. Then you're like, maybe I did it. But there's a balance between sharing and keeping things to yourself. But if you are surrounded by people who are also asleep and you don't have anyone to turn to, that can be really lonely. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the different spiritual things that you're into, because there's a lot of cool stuff in the what some people would call woo woo world. (laughs) So, you know, there's tarot cards, um, astrology, there's channeling and spirit guides and crystals. And like, what, what, what do your spiritual practices look like? At first I was spread really thin and because it was so exciting and I was experiencing so many things for the first time or like deepening something that I had already been interested in. I just did, I cast my net and collected as much as I could. I got into as much as I could. So I was very much on the like spirituality 101 with astrology, meditation, sounds healing, tarot, shadow work, yoga, numerology, like herbalism, all of these things. I was just like dabbling my toe in. And because of the previous company that I started, but have since left, we also had a podcast and we interviewed so many people on so many things. So it was constantly learning. But then I got to a point where I was just saturated. I couldn't absorb anymore. I couldn't read another horoscope. I didn't want to pull any tarot cards. I just completely retracted from my spiritual exploration. And then I was much more discerning and intentional about what I brought in and what my daily practices are. So that really is like yoga, meditation, journaling. Sometimes Mm -hmm. I just want to journal. And for me, that is incredibly spiritual. I'm a writer by trade now by career and author, publish author. Hey, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> high five. <laughs> high five. But as a kid, I mean, I, I started my first diary when I was eight and I have a box of journals and diaries. I'm a, I'm a prolific writer in my own, for my own personal situations, but sometimes that's all I can do. And sometimes that's exactly what I need. And that can be more profound than going to see a medium or reading my horoscope or looking into my natal chart. And I mean, when I say reading my horoscope, I'm not reading my like three line cosmopolitan generic horoscope. I'm like <laughs> getting down into it. So yeah, I've, I've really trimmed my interest because I don't have the time to be into everything. And then mm-hmm. I'm like not getting very deep into anything, you know, it's just like snorkeling rather than diving into the depths. Yeah. You know, what's so interesting. I just had like a little aha moment as you were saying that and like connected some dots of, at least for me, like pre spiritual journey, I was constantly looking to the external. So you know what people thought and um, my social life and the party scene and and all of that. And then you kind of have this awakening to, Hmm, maybe that's not what matters in life. And you start to go on your spiritual journey and I, I bet it's very common for the beginning of a spiritual journey to then also be looking at all the external to like explain, explain, you kind of become this sponge of wanting to know all this stuff, but it is all still very like external, just external within the spiritual world. Whereas now you've landed in stuff that just completely brings you internal. So like yoga, meditation, journaling, like that is all just mm-hmm. not what are the stars telling me right. I'm feeling or going through right now, but like sit and get quiet with yourself and, and just learn from you. Like that's, that's like an interesting repeat of the same like process. Totally. And it's an externalization of power, which is the same way I feel about religion. You're going to pray to a God in the sky and put all of your energy outside of yourself. That doesn't make any sense. You are the one who contains the energy. So when you flip that and reverse it, flip it and reverse it and put everything into your internal and put so much energy into understanding yourself rather than seeking to be understood by others. That's when true change happens. And that's when you inspire other people to do the same thing rather than standing on your soapbox yelling about how things should be and how people should act. You just act and you just be. Yes. Oh, I, yes. Okay. I love that you just said that because 
I, so the whole premise of this podcast, you know, it's all about our relationship with ourself and, and going inward and, and that change starts with us. And that's something that I think can so easily get lost in so many aspects of society and our culture and just things going on in, in the world today that it can be so tempting to look outward at other people, systems, culture, norms, and and point at what's wrong. And and I'm not saying there isn't there aren't things that are wrong, but I just very much believe like that change always happens from within. Mm-hmm. And so I don't, I think, but I think that that can be difficult to, to really fully believe and live through kind of in the, in our current environment, especially. Well, sometimes it doesn't seem like it's enough. It doesn't seem like it's enough to just be right by yourself and to do right by what is in integrity and in authenticity with yourself. Mm -hmm. It might seem like it's lacking, but if you don't have that foundation, it's so easy to slip down that hill of externalization and of popping off and getting mad and and reacting instead of responding. And that foundation of self, of knowing yourself, of understanding yourself, of working through your shadows, transmuting them into light, using your pain, putting that into your purpose, that will give you the foundation to really then go out and make change. But if you haven't healed yourself, and you're trying to change the world, you're wrong. Mm. So, all right, this might be a just really big and difficult question, but so how, and I'm sure you can probably really only speak to your own experience. Like, how did you get to that place? Like, what were some of the, whether it be like kind of different stages or phases you went through or realizations you had or um, kind of teachers you sought out, but like, how did you how did you get to that place? I think it was really just awareness of where I was and understanding that that wasn't working and not judging myself and being okay with wanting something different, wanting someone different, wanting a different job, wanting to live a different place, wanting to go against societal norms of college, husband, kids, career you know, and I think it was, it was, there were a lot of hard nights where I felt like I was crazy and where I felt like I would never have what everybody else did because I didn't want to do what everybody else was doing. It, it really was work, but it was just being honest with myself and coming from a non-judgmental place and being like, okay, if this is my no, then what is my yes? And I knew exactly what I didn't want, but I wasn't really sure what I did. And so I just started exploring and trying things out and being okay with failing. I mean, I would love to say that I just always knew I've always been like an old soul. I always wanted to hang out with the adults when I was a little kid. And I was just never this like playful child. But in growing up, I understand that I was always so serious about stuff and letting go of being so serious and taking everything so seriously, especially myself, created so much room within so that I had freedom to explore without judgment. I had freedom to fail. I had freedom to say, fuck no to this thing that I don't want anymore and not explaining why. Mm -hmm. And then that led me towards what was yes. And now I'm living in a, in a super yes world, but I'm 34. (laughs) It wasn't really until after my Saturn return at 28 that I took charge of my life and took my decisions to heart and from the heart. Yeah. I, I mean, I, same with me. Like I, it wasn't until my Saturn return somewhere around 30 that I think I even had any realization that I was not that I was living in a, in a a world that actually felt like no. Mm -hmm. And, but then it took me two more years before I even did anything about it. So, I mean, it, it is a process and I just, it can be so difficult to explain because you're right. Like it's, it kind of all comes down to, at least I've found it comes down to 
just constant awareness and acceptance of where you are and not attaching to any of that. Mm -hmm. So maybe something feels like a little bit more like, yes. So you start to go down and explore this world and then it doesn't feel like yes anymore. And so then you go down and explore other things and just kind of like almost allowing that fluidity within who you are, as well as like the process you're on. But it's just so hard because that isn't really how our society is structured. That isn't in line with like the masculine energy we've been living in for so long, which is really more like ABC, one, two, three, like this is what you do. Don't ask questions, just get to the end point. Yeah. 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 And I don't even know if if I, I don't even know if I'm making any sense because it's like when you start to try and talk about this stuff, it's like, it's so conceptual that it's, it's difficult. Well, and is, it is going to be incredibly personal and everyone is going to have a different experience. Everyone is going to have a different catalyst. Everyone is going to have a different result. But as long as you're doing what's authentic for you, you're fine. And if that doesn't mm-hmm. resonate anymore, like especially talking about spiritual practices and having my hand in as many <laughs> witch hats as they possibly could in the beginning, some things didn't resonate anymore that started me on my spiritual path that were my literal rocks and anchors I don't do anymore. And that's no judgment, no attachment, but practicing non-attachment is not only so difficult, but there's a sense of grief that comes with moving away from something or someone or whatever, a dream, even if you thought that you were supposed to do one thing or that you were going to, you're attached to that. Releasing that attachment creates grief. Mm-hmm. And it's in healing that grief and forgiving yourself and accepting what is that will empower you so much that eventually you don't have these realizations that you've been living in a no. No doesn't exist. You say no and have literally like no questions about it. And your yeses are immediate and they're in the gut and they're intuition and they lead you to these places that amplify that yes and that expand into more yeses but people feel so bad about saying no even to themselves mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. it's like if you're going to cross boundaries a of all with yourself then you're going to be of all allow everybody around you to cross your boundaries and then you're just formless and you dissolve into what everybody else wants you to be because you can't stand up for yourself yes oh gosh that's girl so I, true. Was, I people <laughs> pleaser until like my mid twenties. And I was like, fuck this. I don't want to do it. And coincidentally, that's when I started traveling for like really extended periods of time out of the country by myself. And I moved to Spain at 27 with nothing but a backpack and a dream, having left a career, a relationship, a whole bunch of things, an entire life that I was supposed to have by 30. And people think that you can only do that when you're like 18 and 19, just leave and travel. But it's whatever is right for you. And leaving everything behind that isn't, is the best thing that you could ever do. You're going to have pushback, but as long as you're not pushing back on yourself, it doesn't matter. Right. I, I totally agree. And one of the places where I, even to this day, get a little bit tripped up is kind of distinguishing between that gut intuition voice um and and fear yeah and so and i feel like i can only tell the difference in hindsight at this point in time but then i also know that's part of the process and eventually i'll probably be able to figure out in real time but i think it's really hard to cuz they're just they're both they can both be very subtle voices mm-hmm. of like oh this is what feels right for me or this is what doesn't feel right for me Versus like something that is actually more fear or ego driven of, you know, you shouldn't do this because of all these reasons that have nothing to actually do with like what's best for you. So Mm -hmm. how do you, do you have advice for helping people kind of distinguish or figure out what really is that, that gut intuitive feeling and knowing, like, how do we know what that is? Well, fear is an emotion, right? So when you're feeling something out of fear or you're making a decision out of fear, or you're afraid of something happening because of your ego attachment to it, or whatever the reason being, you're going to also feel emotion. You're going to get hot or your heart's going to start racing or something is going to happen 
viscerally for you to detect. When it's intuition and it comes from the gut, it's a knowing. It's just Mm. there. It arrives and you see it and you're like, oh, so you don't have that rush or that goosebumps or anything like that when it's intuition. It's just a calm, resonant baseline knowing. Yeah, I I love that. So a a good friend of mine is currently reading, I believe it's Glennon Doyle's new book. And she was telling me about how she talks a lot about kind of settle into the body Mm -hmm. and, and try and start to feel like if you're kind of weighing options, like what different options feel like. And, and if you do get that kind of those like more anxiety related feelings associated with it, then that's not the knowing like that's Mm -hmm. fear versus kind of that calm. Well, that's a reaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it it is really hard to tell the difference between the two. And then you're questioning yourself and you're like, shit, is this my intuition? Was that really right? Am I just afraid? And you can go down the rabbit hole really easy, but the only way to do it is to keep doing it. It's a muscle. Your intuition is muscle. And it doesn't know you want to use it because we've been suppressing it for so long, or maybe you have it. I don't know, but I don't believe that our society wants us truly to be operating out of our intuition. They want us to be operating out of fear. So it can be really difficult to distinguish between the two, but you just have to start. You just have to, even like with easy, silly stuff, like use your body as a pendulum and stand up straight and be like, okay is my name Morgan Garza and feel which way that goes. And then ask yourself something that's an absolute no and feel which way that goes. Like your body will sway. It's wild. So tuning into little things like that, that can help you build that muscle will be really helpful in the beginning when you are questioning yourself and you don't know whether it's fear or intuition or get an actual pendulum like a a crystal hanging on a string. You can even tie a a safety pin to a string, like anything that will hang heavier than the object that it's hanging off of. You can use as a pendulum and you can practice your intuition. Oh, that's super interesting. I'm definitely going to try that. Like the, Oh, it'll blow your mind. It's wild. It's so cool. I'm totally going to try that because the, the one thing I, I tried recently, which was a little bit helpful was Cause I, I will, I am famous for, I will go down the rabbit hole. Like I am an analytical person. I was like a psychology major. I'm like into all of it. I want to figure it out. Like my brain's like, yeah, yeah, let's figure this out. And whereas the intuition is more of a knowing. And so what I've, what I've come to realize is like, I can't think my way into figuring out if I'm in my gut or if it's like intuition or if it's fear. So rather than try and figure it out, which is what my brain really wants to do. Like I just do nothing. Yeah. And then usually <laughs> <Do> less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just do less. And then the next day or a couple of days later, it that's when kind of that knowing arises. It but it's itself out. Yeah. Yeah. I've got to like stop myself from trying to figure it out, which is not easy no. for especially me because I and that's almost one of the catch 22s of like being in this work is like, you're very aware of like, Oh, I've got to be doing the work. I'm always doing the work. But then mm-hmm. sometimes the work is actually to do nothing. Nothing. Do, do, don't do anything. Well, and you're not using your head when you're trying to figure something out that is based in your heart. You can't mm-hmm. employ your head for that job. You have to bench your brain and then ask your heart what it wants and what feels good and listen, create the space Our minds are run by our egos and they want to keep us away from the heart centered feeling of intuition. I don't know why, who knows, but it's the plight of humanity. Yeah. I think that's part of the, that's part of the learning process. That's right. That's the, that's why we're all here. Yeah. And everything just happened easy all the time. We would have no comparison to realize that the polarization of these things are, are both inherently necessary to grow and understand things. If everything was just intuition, we wouldn't ever know what the ego felt like trying to tear us down or trying to like bring this other perspective in. So they have to work together and there's no getting rid of the ego. You literally have to understand where your ego is coming from, how to manage it and how to shut it off 
when you need to, but you're never going to be without it. So, and it's in your head. So learning to live with it is, is the best way. And that's just by strengthening your intuition and having super massive intentional control over your mind. Well, and so I love that you say that because I think that's another, um, kind of trap in the spiritual world is this concept that the the ego kind of gets villainized and we're all supposed Mm -hmm. to try and completely get rid of it. And it was actually in a previous episode, I was talking to a psychologist um, and he was all about Jungian psychology. Mm -hmm. And he was like, no, you know, we're all about working with the ego, like developing a healthy relationship with it. Mm -hmm. And I just, I love that so much more than trying to completely like silence and abolish your ego, because I think that's one, like, you know, that's not completely accepting your whole self because your whole self includes an ego. Yeah. And so anything that takes the the viewpoint of something as extreme as like totally get rid of your ego, I think is probably actually not the true spiritual path. So I like that. I love that you recognize that we can't get rid of it. So oh yeah. But that really is, it's a huge problem in the spiritual industry and that's exactly what the love and light is about. And even the law of attraction, it's half of the equation. There's no love and light without black holes. There's no manifestation without shadow work preceding what you want to bring in. There's no space for anything to come in if you're full of your own shit. Okay. So let's talk a little <laughs> bit about that, about that sh- uh, shadow work. Yeah. So, so what is shadow work? It's realizing that you have pain and trauma and that it's affecting your life and that it's, it's controlling your reactions and actions. That's really it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, all right. So I like, and we that all have it. No one is without a shadow. And that is another thing that we have to live with and not get rid of like the ego. Ah, okay. So my next question was going to be like, how do we get rid of our shadows? You, can't get rid no. of the shadows. you see the shadows, you acknowledge them, you accept them. It's basically, I'm going to tell you all inner child healing. It all primarily comes from childhood and then mm-hmm. builds into these grand cityscapes that you think are just supposed to be there. And you are like, well, this is just how we live. But when you really get into it, you're like, I don't have to live with this pain. I don't have to ruin every relationship because of this thing that happened to me when I was seven. I don't have to lose all of the money I ever make or never make money because I was raised that money is inherently evil or that there's not enough of it or that when you get it, bad things happen. Like there's all of these ideas that are implanted in our heads when we're young that grow into shadows because they live in our closet and we're too afraid to open the door and face the monster that's in there that literally cannot harm us. The harm is being done by not looking at it. And so shadow work is just looking at yourself and accepting it and accepting who you've hurt and how you've hurt yourself and what you've kept yourself away from. And then deciding to not do that anymore and going through the process of healing the initial root cause of the pain and the trauma. And then you can take that and you'll be, you'll be battle worn by then, but the scars will give you a stronger foundation on which to stand upon. And you can go into life knowing that you've healed these parts of yourself, that you're not going to act this way anymore. And then you open up space for more aligned things, higher vibrational things to come in and take your life to places that you only dreamt of before, or maybe you couldn't even dream that it is possible. And then all of a sudden, all of these amazing things are happening and you're like, okay, so I just have to accept this. And it's always going to live with you, these pains and traumas, but they don't have to define you. And that's really what the process is for to, to get rid of that definition and that you're going through life as a person who blah, 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 blah. And now you're just a person. Okay. So that's all right. I, it's pretty, right, practical. I love that. It's like really not spiritual. It, it is practical. Okay. Let, let's use an example though. Cause I think this will just help me and other people fully understand it. All right. So you mentioned, um, like you mentioned a relationship with money 
So I'll use me as an example. I've kind of come to this realization recently that I like, I resent money. And I think I resent money because I, I don't like that there's this aspect that we need it and that we're supposed to work these jobs that don't make us happy in order to get it and live life. I I just, I don't know. I've got some kind of resentment Mm -hmm. and I've been thinking like, okay, how do I, how do I heal that? How do I, you know, get rid of that resentment, that shadow? And then just the other day I was like, okay, Casey, maybe it's not about healing it. Maybe it's just about being aware of it and accepting it. And then it'll go away on its own because you see it and accept it. So like, do I have to go back and figure out where that shadow comes from? Or is there a way to just kind of see it, embrace it, accept it? And and then that will do the healing. I think it depends on the gravity of the resentment and the depth of, of the shadow. I mean, it could have been something was implanted in you when you were little, that money is inherently evil and that all work is terrible and no one likes their jobs, but you have to do it anyway, because we have to have money. And unfortunately we can't just trade in beans and goats, you know, (laughs) but can't we just go back to that? (laughs) I'm not going to say for sure, but pretty much for sure. It's probably something that happened to you when you were much younger that you have developed this belief around. And now it defines Mm -hmm. how you interact with call in and give out money. And so just acknowledging it is the first step. Yes. But then as you sit with that a little bit, you don't have to go shadow hunting. Someone incredible once told me, if you go shadow hunting, you're going to get killed because you're not ready to face the things that you're literally digging up. It's like crystals that are ready to be owned by people. They just come out of the ground instead of what a lot of the practices of people owning crystals now is that they're mined. They're pulled out of the earth. They aren't ready. But when you're ready... Mm -hmm having that awareness that you do have a resentment towards money will grow and that will develop. And that awareness will give you permission to keep exploring why. So is it almost like going back to what we were talking about earlier, like doing nothing, like just the starting with the awareness, not forcing anything and like trusting that the shadow will surface, like don't go hunting for it. The shadow will, the root will surface for me to deal with in its own time. Right. And then you can find the support that will help you deal with that root in a way that's constructive and productive rather than shameful or guilt ridden or being like, why did I ever believe this? You know, like there's a, it's a tricky line, but I think the do nothing is definitely important, but that can't be the forever plan. Right. That it, you're so right. It is such a like subtle difference of like how we view it kind of this, oh, I recognize this and I want to go heal it, which is kind of on the surface level, a good intention, but then ultimately it's not because then I'm like kind of judging myself for it versus like seeing it, accepting it, looking for the, or being open to the opportunity to heal it once the opportunity presents itself. Mm-hmm. Like working with life versus trying to, I guess, Push. grow faster than like my growth plan. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, yeah. Which you can't do. You can't grow faster. It's like people who go down to Peru for an ayahuasca ceremony and think that it's a reset button and that their life is going to be better and that it's a fast track to healing. But it's actually opening up an entire Pandora's box that you have to look at and you have to deal with. And these people come back and they try to integrate into their lives and go back to work or go back to their relationship. And they find that they literally can't because what they thought was going to be a quick fix is now a lifelong task. And Mm -hmm. I highly recommend not trying to fast track anything. It'll only bite you it'll, it'll come back bigger and you won't be equipped for it because you're obviously trying to fast track it. So you don't want to hold space for whatever it is within you. That's trying to be seen. Yes. Oh, that, oh, that makes total sense. So it really just is this acceptance of the journey and the, the timeline of your growth as it unfolds and not pushing, just allowing and it's just loving yourself. You just have (laughs) to love yourself. 
there's only fear and there's only love. Every emotion stems from those two roots. And so Mm -hmm. it's easy when you get down to it to understand what is fear and what is love because there's only the two. Mm -hmm. And if you just love yourself rather than live in fear of what's inside you, you can handle it. You're never going to have anything come into your life that you can't handle. The universe works in mysterious ways, yes, but we're never given something that's going to break us unless we're already broken and we're just not willing to accept the gift of the challenge. Oh, I love that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about your upcoming book, okay. which is available for presale now, but it actually rolls out end of August is the, yeah. the plan for now. Understanding uh-huh. that could change. Yes. Um, so, so tell us a little bit about, uh, about the book. So it's called soul magic, ancient wisdom for modern mystics. And it's, it's a exploration of spiritual practices and their origin, where they came from, why they were developed in the way they were, how the ancient mystics used these practices and created them with, well, in co-creation with the universe and spirituality and mysticism and everything else that is, you can't see, but it's, it's felt. And what I, well, I have a co-author and what we really wanted to do was to bring reverence back to these practices that have been Westernized and Mm. to bring awareness to their roots and to the fact that they primarily all came from pretty much the same place. And that's Mesopotamia, like the ancient origins of civilization really developed a lot of the practices that we still use today. And so it's a, it's an ancient rooted way of looking at everything that we use now and how to use it and how to integrate these things into your modern life while still maintaining reverence and respect for where they came from. Oh, I love that. So I just started reading, um, the four agreements yeah. that, that was recently given to me. And I mean, I, I just threw like the introduction maybe into the, I'm not even into the first agreement yet. Like I just started this, yeah. book, but it was talking about the ancient wisdom that it, that it stems from. And I just, I don't know, there was something about that, that I found so intriguing. I'm like, Oh yeah. Like all of this stuff comes back from, comes from like just way long ago. And I just started to think about like how interesting that is, like the, the historical elements of all of this. And of course, as it's gotten, a lot of stuff has gotten Westernized, you know, it loses a little bit of the, well, it loses a lot of the history and even a little bit of the magic because we've, you know, monetized everything. But so Mm -hmm. I love that concept. (laughs) Well, it's really cool once you start digging into all of this stuff and you realize that that even your yoga class at LA Fitness has these deeply ancient roots that it's not just about the asanas and about how well you can do chair pose. It's so much deeper. It's a lifestyle. And that is only one of the eight ways that you can experience yoga in your life. So helping people to understand that what they're doing is great, but there's so much more to it. And that can even bring so much more to your life that can deepen your practice and your understanding and deepen your spirituality and expand your love for yourself and others and just humanity in general, because you have a different perspective and understanding of where we've come from and how we came to be who we are today. And I think living in the Western world is incredibly different because a lot of these practices are still alive and well in many of the places that they've come from. And so really making a point to not just culturally appropriate what's popular on Instagram and Mm -hmm. to, to do the research into what it is and the why behind it. Oh, I love that. Okay. (laughs) Just to give us all a little bit of like a teaser, what are, what are a couple of the, the practices that you, that you dig into in the book? So there's a lot. We have aromatherapy, crystal healing, numerology, um, spirit communication, and past life regression, which is really cool. There's a whole chapter on shadow work, on yoga, on sacred travel, like in the pilgrimage sense, and how to travel sacredly 
now and how to follow your intuition when you're in a new city. I love this part. It's like, if you're walking down a street in a place you've never been, ask yourself where you want to go. Like, do you want to go left or right? And don't follow a map. Don't schedule out your day. Don't do all of these things and try to hit as many sites as you possibly can on a 10 day trip or a two day trip. You know, it's really more living in the flow. So there's a lot of things that are covered in the book, but they all will just bring you home back to yourself. Oh, I love it. That sounds absolutely amazing. Um, Okay. So I want to close out with just some of your favorite teachers or or people or books who have had a, a really big impact on your journey. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita from which is like the ancient origins of yoga really expanded how I thought about the connection between the body and mind. And then mm-hmm. I felt that viscerally when I was on the mat and I was able to connect deeper in that way. Um, I think one of the biggest teachers of all has, has been yoga. It, it amplified my connection to myself, my understanding of how the body can be controlled by the mind and how the mind can be controlled by the body. There's not any one person that I necessarily follow that I would recommend. I think everybody's different and you're just going to, you're going to go towards different people as it comes. But if you're into yoga, I would absolutely recommend starting with the Bhagavad Gita or looking into um like current spiritual teachers that are in a modality that you want to go to because a lot of people will go to a teacher and then they're teaching kundalini or they're really just focusing on breath work or it's like all about the empowerment of the self and some people just don't resonate with that so like rather than going to a specific person I would go to modalities and then find people within that, if that makes sense. It, it does. And and that's one of the things, you know, with yoga, there's so many different types and, and like, so Kundalini yoga is something like I keep hearing about. And then I, I tried one class that we had locally here in, in Jacksonville. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt of how great the <laughs> class was, but I did not, I was so excited about it. And then I did not like resonate with it. And I'm like, Oh, was it like that type of yoga or was it just this teacher in this class? Yeah. And so I think, I think that's an important point for in general, just with all of this work is like, follow what resonates with you. But but also like do a little bit of exploring, like you try one type of yoga class. And if that doesn't resonate, that doesn't mean yoga in general isn't for you because there's Mm -hmm. a bunch of different types. Yeah. And the same with breath work and the same with herbalism. I mean, there's so many teachers that I've, I've learned from that have created the patchwork of what my life is today, but I don't want to tell anybody to go towards one person because really in the end, the point is to go towards yourself. Yes. Ah, oh, okay. Well, that's, <laughs> that's the perfect note to end on. Um, tell everybody where they can pre-order your book, where they can find you, follow you, all of that good stuff. Everything is going to be on morgangarza.com. That's it. Wonderful. Yep. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank I really you, appreciate Katie. it. I love these super spiritual conversations. It's really nice to to be on a podcast like this where it truly is a conversation and it's not a laundry list of questions and and being able to go with the flow has been so refreshing. So thank you so much. Well, and that's like kind of one of the bigger themes of this whole conversation is to just go with the flow. Yeah. Do less. <laughs> yes. So in terms of my prepping for this interview, I just did a blank sheet of paper do less there you go i always think of forgetting sarah marshall when i say that when he's like trying to yeah. learn surfing. <laughs> surfing. yeah do less no but do less and then he just the, lays there he's like well do more yeah but that's like the most profound thing you can tell anyone when they're really on their spiritual journey just like just kind of stop stop it yeah <laughs> Stop it. I love it. All right. That will do it for this week. Thank you again for listening. If you enjoyed this conversation, then please do me a favor and share it with friends, share it on your socials or rate the podcast and leave it a review on iTunes. All of those things help me grow the show, help with discoverability and help me continue to do this and hopefully bring more just inspiring and thought provoking conversations, which I am loving doing. 
You can also follow the podcast on the socials. We are on Facebook and Instagram at the better you podcast. And as always, if you have feedback for me or want to reach me, you can do so at the better you podcast at gmail.com. That is it. Thank you again. Enjoy the rest of your day and I will see you all next week.